Hey pals, quick note before we get started. This is number two of three of our reruns from season four. You knew there was no way we would get through this rerun series without including an episode that isn't the most popular. It was a really tough choice for us to go through all the potential picks like Amen Send Money, The Callous of October, Missing Hours. There was lots to choose from. But an easy favorite of your Go With The Heat crew is The Big Thaw. We had so much fun with this episode, and it really was nice to get early in the season a fun episode from Miami Vice. And no matter what, we will always know that somewhere out there is a Rastafarian popsicle floating in the Atlantic Ocean. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And, and this is your cultural guy's phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season four, episode four, titled The Big Thaw. We should have known what was coming based on the name of this episode. Not only was it titled The Big Thaw, but they delivered on a popsicle in the <laughs> very beginning. <laughs> yes. It originally premiered on October 23rd, 1987. It is written by Joseph de Blasi. Hold on a second. That's not his real name. He wrote under the pseudonym for just this episode. So it comes off as like he didn't want to put his name on this episode. I don't know why. I mean, <laughs> why would that be? Why? <laughs> This seems to be a trend. It's like no writers wanted to be no. It, it was like that job for writers uh, or directors where it was bottom bin, you know. Like, I'll write it, but I don't want to put my name on it. I don't want anyone to know I was associated with you guys. But I need the money, so. <laughs> I will take your money. <laughs> His real name is Michael Duggan. Now, we've seen Michael Duggan a bunch already. He wrote Baby Blues, Lend Me an Ear, Knock Knock, Who's There, Viking Bikers from Hell. He's also the story editor for seasons three and four and wrote a ton of the teleplay. So he translates the script into what they read on set and the story editor. And for some reason, he's done all that work, including Viking Bikers from Hell. And he's like, I'm not putting my name on this one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that should be fine right there. (laughs) Yeah, watch this one. I was like, nope, not doing it. It is directed by Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2. Everybody's in showbiz. He's still got four more episodes coming. So that's the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Before we get started, we can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we've got to make a quick announcement. We are going to be off next week. And again, this is because of me. Every time we seem to be off, it's because of something that I have done or I'm going to be doing. We're going to be off next week because I'm going to be on the road doing work nine to five work stuff instead of podcasting stuff. So we're going to take the week off. I just won't have time to get everything that needs to be done to get this show made. But we'd love to hear from you. Email me, go with the at gmail.com. Let me know when we have these weeks off. Do you prefer no episode or classic episode? Like put one of our previous episodes into the feed. That way you'll see it pop in there. Let me know what you think on that. Go with the heat at gmail.com, twitter.com slash go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. Love to hear what, what your thoughts are on that and what we should do when we're off for a week. Now, it's just one week. We'll be back the week after. That's good because it'll give me time to catch up on some of my uh, TV and Netflix watching, starting with possibly the worst show on television. <laughs> um, I am catching up on the newest season of the Shinra chronicles and i'm probably even pronouncing that wrong but (laughs) it's a show made by i believe mtv's production studio so you know it's good if mtv's (laughs) behind it (laughs) and it's like lord of the rings but it's like supposed to be set after the collapse of modern day you have elves in designer jeans with bows and swords fighting trolls on what used to be san francisco and la I, I this is supposed to be peak TV, so I'm I was under the impression that all TV is good right now, you know, because I've kind of checked out on TV, so I haven't really watched any of this quote unquote peak TV. But what it sounds to me like, not everything's peak TV. Yeah, this sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of bad TV, <laughs> <laughs> what a segue. We might be a little bit hard on this episode. This episode was a lot of fun. It was actually, and you could tell that it was Vice trying to have fun. Not necessarily they were just bad and it's fun because you like laugh at them. There's a lot of jokes in this yeah, episode. Yeah, there was, yeah. So let's go have some fun yeah. with Miami Vice at their expense. <laughs> <laughs> so we open up and the duo are staked out outside of 
the Fountain of Youth, a fo- formerly a retirement home. I hope a really long time ago, because that place was in bad condition. <laughs> Why was it bright green? <laughs> I think they were trying to make people happy. Bright colors, you know. <laughs> Sonny's even telling a story about how he used that place used to give him a creeps when he was a kid. Uh, what was he doing there? He was like trying to tell some story on why he was there all the time. He liked old people? I don't know. <laughs> no, but my coffee's cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I tech pulls up and Sonny says to him, quote, what happened to you? Stop for a snow cone waffle head? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I like about this, too, is one, the van is the same color green as the building. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and two, apparently they were only waiting for Zwitek so that he could bring them bolt cutters. That's the whole reason they're, they're the only reason he's here. It was like, hey, go get us some bolt cutters. <laughs> well, he also mentions that he had to go wake up a judge to get, I think it's to get the warrant. That way they can go in there. Stan finally shows up. He's complaining about waking the judge up in the middle of the night jokey vice like right out of the get-go they squeeze in jokes right here in the opening so they go inside and they cut the lock off this door this is one room apparently in this whole place is all the theory it's padlock on the outside of it and the camera goes out for a second too, <laughs> yeah so that kinda... was kind of weird like is that on purpose or an accident <laughs> <laughs> and they've been investigating like where certain chemicals have been going so it sounds like they're expecting it to be a drug bust but when they get in there they're really surprised at what the quote-unquote lab is they find that that container that looks like almost like like a big bomb or something <laughs> and they look through like the glass to see what's in it. And come and behold, here is this Rastafarian popsicle. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back at him. Everything's really fancy would, in this room, too. Everything's I bet really... you if, I, if you licked him, you would get high. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his name is Robillard Nevin. He's a very famous reggae singer. And everyone in the room is very, very confused, including saying he's, quote, stone cold frozen. (laughs) The one liners in this one are pretty good. (laughs) And then we go to the opening credits. Title, Big Thaw, make a joke about Switek when he comes pulling up about him being a waffle head. (laughs) They go in to this and they see that it's a reggae singer frozen. Like, okay, okay. So this is how this episode is going to be. Like, we're going to have a lot of fun here. And uh, Uh just keep that in mind. (laughs) Don't worry, folks. By the end of the episode, you're going to be missing the hookers and the drugs. (laughs) When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the precinct. And there's a couple of men with Switek and the duo that are carrying the tube in are Rastafarian. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So they just unplugged him and just brought him back to the precinct like he was a piece of like luggage or something. (laughs) Yep. Hey, guys, look what we found. We hope he doesn't thaw on the way uh, over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there like a car battery in this tube or something? How is it powered? How is it keeping him frozen? This is Miami. It's like 85 degrees out. Oh, the whole episode, they're complaining about how hot it is, too, because the AC's been out in their office and they're getting it like, like a new AC being put in. So everyone's hot. And this is one of those episodes where everyone is moody because it's so hot, too. Like that's a little bit of Miami culture. That's mm-hmm. happening in this episode. Especially Switek. Just saying. <laughs> uh-huh. but, but, but the green popsicle stays frozen solid the whole time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> when they carry the tube in, the doctor is following in tow and he's protesting big time. He doesn't have the right paperwork to say that he's supposed to have the popsicle. But he says it's his science experiment. You can't just take him. Although the tube is sealed so tight that he can stay in there for 90 days without there being a threat of him unthawing. That sounds like some shady science. I don't believe that. <laughs> so, so you're saying we don't have to plug him back in? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. For, He's good. For three months, he can just be there. <laughs> All right. The doctor is saying is that he's not dead. He's cryogenically frozen and he wanted it to be a secret and he wants to be reanimated once there was a cure found for what was wrong with him after so he's eating dead. poison fish yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not just any poison fish he died from eating poisonous blowfish soup that's a thing well if you watch the but simpsons don't worry <laughs> <laughs> don't worry this guy trained under dr frankenstein <laughs> he esteemed Dr. Frankenstein, and he can bring him back. <laughs> this even pulls Dad um, out of his office. He comes out and says, get the doctor out of here. No press. 
because they're going to surround the building because apparently Nevin is really famous. Is he whispering? I know. He's like, get him at, like, he can still hear you. <laughs> we can all still hear you, Castillo. <laughs> Dad also says this is top priority. Everyone in the department is on this case. Whatever the case is. Like, what? <laughs> so, case of the, we, we're stuck with a frozen dead body no one investigate hookers or drugs for the next two weeks we've got a frozen rastafarian to deal with don't they have a lost and found <laughs> they don't even have an evidence lockup they said no they he said that he goes we don't have an evidence lock up why though. is this their problem i don't know that's a good question this is one of the ones where i agree with you guys this is not their problem <laughs> The duo grab the doctor and they head over to his lab where the doctor's showing him where he's frozen both a dog and a cat seven times. The cat is not good. <laughs> I have questions so, about hey, that cat. <laughs> this guy's freezing house pets uh, for fun. <laughs> Why are we going any further? Someone get this guy a psych evaluation. Exactly. Why don't you arrest him for animal cruelty? That cat was clearly like dead or something. I don't know. The dog was fine. <laughs> <laughs> the dog wasn't happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will mention uh, the good doctors played by Bill Raymond, who we've seen before. We here at the podcast would best know him from 10 episodes of The Wire, where he played the Greek. But he was also in 12 Monkeys, Son of Sam, The Hurricane, and a bunch of other movies. He's also in the episode where we get to see Crockett unhinged, where he's walking with them. I'm like, yeah, that's great. In We'll forgive us our debts. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pow! Punches him right in the stomach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> and then beating him up. Throws him mm -hmm. in the pool and slaps him around. <laughs> That's the best, Crockett, slapping <laughs> people around. <laughs> he slapped him around so much that he woke up freezing reggae artists. <laughs> Well, while they're talking to the doctor and he's harassing pet store pets, yeah, <laughs> Izzy comes walking in with mm -hmm. with Manny. We got a Manny sighting. It's been a while since we've had a Manny. He sighting. is alive. <laughs> and it, is it any shock that yes. Izzy would be involved in this mess? No. <laughs> <laughs> and still uncredited, we still have no idea who Manny is. <laughs> the, the mystery of Manny continues. <laughs> Here's what we get out of this scene: Izzy was bringing a pizza. Dr. Poe liked him, and so we kept him around. Izzy takes care of Dr. Poe. Poe is the one that found a cure for eating fugu. And so they have a test patient in Nevin that po Dr. Poe is going to unfreeze him and cure him later that day at 4 p.m. that day when Japanese investors are coming in to see it happen. He's also the only one who actually knows how to unfreeze people. He's like come up with the, the method that they use. Yes, the doctor that we're talking with doesn't he is know. He's also nothing practically from nothing. a vegetable. Yeah, he can't. That's what Izzy's job is. He just feeds him, he takes care of him, and he can't even chew the food. Of course, I don't know why he's giving him like giant spoonfuls of mashed potatoes or whatever. <laughs> Izzy's chewing it for him and then feeding it to him. Like a bird. <laughs> like a bird mom. So now the duo grab Dr. Froble, that's his name, Dr. Froble. They grab Froble, and they're going to take him back over to the precinct. He leaves Izzy and Manny with Dr. Poe. At the precinct, the duo are watching Nevin's music video with the doctor, which is fantastic. The music video is great. The scene actually fades out, yeah, and it know. fades back in, and it's with Nevin's wife, who is frantically, who's been frantically looking for Nevin for months. And she is, like, beside herself, rubbing her hands all over the popsicle tube that's just sitting in the middle of the precinct. <laughs> <laughs> They take her into the meeting room and they start talking to her. The lawyer starts saying, we're going to sue you for you know mistreatment of Mr. Nevin. And you know we're going to come after you for not telling us that you had him. Castillo turns to Switek and says, get oh Nevin God. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of the scene is Crockett asks the lawyer, like, how did you find us? We're an undercover outfit. And the lawyer uh yeah kind of like ignores the question but at the same time it's, it's like well uh, we've been searching for a while and you guys actually aren't very good at hiding yourselves <laughs> i think me and melissa's favorite part is that when Cast the lawyer is saying 
we're going to sue you for disre- disrespecting Nevin's body. And then Castile turns to Swartek says, get him out of here. And then while the lawyer's talking about that, you in the see background, yeah. Swartek in the background like struggling to drag the tube away. He's like dragging it through the middle. Of the- they said, they, no, he said, hey, you, you don't know how this is disrespectful treatment in her time of pain and sorrow. And he's like, I'm sorry. We're sorry that we've done that. You know, and then in the background, you can see Swartek dragging his dead body through. The wife says that him, that her and him were estranged. They were going to get divorced, but the paperwork was never filed. And they've been looking for him for months. They've been following him since he left Japan 18 months ago. So they've been really trying to find him. And then eventually she just drops the act. She turns to the lawyer and says, I want you to get my money. Do your damn job. You guys haven't heard the last of me. And then she storms out. So we know now what her priority is, which isn't my husband has been disrespected. and I want him to be buried in Jamaica. It's, I want my money. I want his estate. It's $30 million. That's what it is. So, I mean, it's quite the estate. By the way, Esther's attorney is played by Alfred Molina, actually credited as Esther's attorney because apparently she didn't pay enough for an actual name. (laughs) Um, Alfred Molina actually started on British television and film in the 70s. And then in 1981, he made his U.S. film debut in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. Damn. He also played Dr. Ock in Spider-Man 2. He was in Boogie Nights, The Man Who Knew Too Little, The Da Vinci Code, and most recently, one season as D.A. Morales in the Law & Order L.A. spinoff. But... Two roles really jump out at me when looking through his IMDb page. One is I completely forgot he played in the amazing Brendan Fraser movie, Dudley (laughs) Do-Right. He played Snide Whiplash. But this one is my favorite. So IMBD, and and because I I haven't seen it, so I can't confirm it. But IMBD lists him as playing Jerry Frazier in Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal, the movie. Wow. There's a one, there's a movie for that? Yeah, what? Two, he would be in that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All kinds of surprises. I hope it's a dramatization. If it's a dramatization, I will watch it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, hopefully it's not a documentary. I, That's even worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I kind of hope that like he's supposed to be playing like an actual real businessman. He's supposed to be playing a real business person, and we're supposed to be like <laughs> watching Trump make a deal. <laughs> so now the duo and the doctor are going to go back over to the Fountain of Youth. They're going to drop him off. This building looks like it should be condemned. So I don't even know why they're letting him work in there. This should be step one that they have to, he has to pull all of his stuff out of there. So I don't know what's going on, why that's even a thing. But when they show up, the police are there. The I don't know who it is, the DA or... It's like an ambulance too. Yeah, like yelling out like they won't let us take the body. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take Dr. Poe's body who has died under Izzy's watch. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yes. Izzy murdered Dr. Frankenstein. Now they can't bring back the reggae popsicle from uh, from the dead. Because he didn't chew his food small enough. He probably choked. I, I'm no tracking. Saliva. I'm tracking, guys. Yeah, and, and uh, immediately they they start trying to like cool his body down. Doctors running around frantic, you know, looking for his giant Ziploc. <laughs> Again, the scene fades out and it fades back in and it's the doctor, Froebel. He's lamenting how he didn't get a chance to freeze Dr. Poe sooner. You know, because there's a you eventually you find a cure for old age, right? Like that would be yeah. a thing. <laughs> Choking on mashed potatoes can be cleared. <laughs> And Izzy comes and talks to Dr. Froebel and he's like, hey, so you studied under him. You know everything about him. You know what would be best is if to honor Dr. Poe's legacy that you went through with unfreezing. And then the Dr. Froebel's like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> he gets up and runs around and he says, I got the instruction. And holds it above his head and then hugs it. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and this we wonder, like, how was he the only one that knew how to thaw him? Did they try running him under a faucet? Because sometimes <laughs> that works for me. If you just you know, run lukewarm water, though, lukewarm. Put it in a big tub. Turn the water on really low and let it trickle in and out. Leave it overnight. <laughs> It'll be okay. <laughs> yes. Good as yes. new when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
So now we go back to the precinct that we see this little short fight between uh, Trudy and Switek. It's really hot in the office. It's Miami, so everyone's going crazy about it being way hot. The AC's broken. Stuff's falling off the ceiling onto Switek as he's trying to work. He gets really mad and goes over there and lays into the AC worker. And Trudy a little bit. And then Trudy turns to Stan and says, you know, it's your problem. You, I treat my body like a temple. You treat yours like an amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> no I, reason to get mad at the HVAC guys. It's not their fault. They're the lowest bidder. Wait a minute. <laughs> Two things about that. One, it's totally true that Stan does that. And I would, I'm totally down with treating myself I can have you swim park. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Two, Trudy looks amazing. And actually, the ladies have been so little used so far this season. It's just nice to see them every once in a while. Yeah, I know. Give them some words. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we go into the meeting room to do our with the ladies to talk to the Castillo. And this just touch on ideas. And one of the ideas is perhaps the band has a reason for Nevin to stay dead or frozen. That's why no one's been able to find him. And Gina know, happens to know where one of the band members is performing or where he lives or whatever. It, I think it's just where he lives. It's where he lives. Yeah. 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 John, this is also in the point of the episode where I started thinking like, so what's happening? What are they investigating exactly? What, is, <laughs> what, what crime have fitted? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mind you, we it, it, we were just specifically told that the murder of Dr. Frankenstein was being investigated by homicide. They are officially only investigating who they're going to release the body to, which at this point in the episode, they have no reason not to to his wife. The other people don't have paperwork. That's not the cop's problem. Stick the wife the body. Exactly. Why are the vice team defending the cryogenesis? A little bit, right? By not get giving up to the wife, they're defending the cryogenesis. Because he says, because the cryogenesis says that he, that he didn't want his body to go to them and go to Look, her specifically because she was, they were divorced and she was, she was like a money greedy. So I guess they're, they're just listening to him. So they're like, well, we have to, we have to investigate yeah, it but, before we give you the body. Because <laughs> no one has yeah, the correct but, paperwork. Like, that's not their problem. They're not the police of the Anna Nicole-isms. <laughs> okay. It, it, if they had just given her body to begin with, she would have never murdered Frankenstein. She True. would have never gone on her little spree. Okay. <laughs> and what happens at the end of the episode? I can tell you this he doesn't get defrosted. <laughs> well, maybe he does. But does he survive the defrosting? No. <laughs> but what I'm saying is neither one of them had the proper paperwork, so they, they just couldn't give him. That's what they're saying. Like, we can't give it to either one of you. She's his he, wife. He He's dead. What proper paperwork does she need? <laughs> <laughs> they were divorced and hadn't lived or separated and hadn't lived together in 18 months. So that would be – she didn't know where he was. <laughs> that would be a problem. <laughs> well, speaking of uncomfortableness – Let's go to the bandmate's house and let the stereotypes begin. Yeah, that was kind of bad. <laughs> Miami's face Jamaica town. <laughs> Just a bunch of blue car banana farmers. <laughs> it's, it is. It's like the most Jamaican racist stereotypes ever. Not only are they singing the entire time, they, everywhere that this band goes, all they do is sing. They're so relaxed, Great. too. They're, like, all happy. Like, yeah. whatever. We yes. don't care about our dead friend. <laughs> and also, they're, like, like in this scene, this kid's just shucking corn in the backyard. <laughs> hey, the corn isn't going to shuck itself, no, no, okay? The, and, and the, yeah. And the kids are, like, pulling bananas apart and stacking them in a pile <laughs> or something. <laughs> Are you saying, are you suggesting, John, that they are tallying bananas? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I am suggesting that they are tallying banana mom. That's why they made that song. <laughs> I always wondered what that meant. <laughs> so let's get back. Daylight come and we got to go home. <laughs> They talk to the man, and he says that Nevin always thought he was dying. Like death was always stalking him around every corner. And that every time he had a cough, he would call Poe. So they have a long history together. 
he then went with Poe to Japan. So this this all sounds like it was planned. He knew he was going to die, so he like went and killed himself for Poe. That way he could get these investors for being cryogenically frozen and then unfrozen. Well, I think what he was trying to say was that maybe he didn't kill himself. It was like he was murdered. Like someone poisoned him, and then Poe was going to use him as a guinea pig. I don't even know about. I think I think what he, uh, I think because he says like Poe just swooped him away on a jet to Japan. I would suspect that Poe convinced him that he was going to die from eating this soup and convinced him to let him freeze him. He may have never been actually poisoned to begin with. Poe just talked it, told him he was a hypochondriac and Poe just convinced him that he was going to die. So he uh, needed to freeze him. That's super so, interesting that he tricked him into being frozen. That way he could use them as a test subject. Yeah, maybe and it'd be it, someone really died. famous yeah. for the Japanese investors. But the end of the conversation with the band is my favorite part because they go, he got whisked away on the jet. So we came home to wait for him and he just never came home. We're, we're just still hanging out here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> on to my favorite scene this episode. We're going to head over to the coffee shop and the duo are sitting at a table and they're discussing life extension and like what this being cryogenically frozen means to each of them. That's not what I'm paying attention to. It's in the middle of the day and Sonny is having a beer, which we all expect at this point that Sonny's just a raging alcoholic. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Tubbs is having a chocolate milk. Now we've talked about this before with Tubbs. I I think I have I have a different theory. I don't think that's a chocolate milk. If you look in the background, it says they make margaritas. I think that's a margarita because it looked pink to me. It didn't look brown. Really? See, because we have a history with tubs. Oh, he does get root he beer gets floats. Root floats and sundays and <laughs> smoothies. He's gotten chocolate milk before. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, he's the healthy one, right? He's, the he's like a 12-year-old. <laughs> Can I get a tutti fruity, but, please? <laughs> uh, Shirley Temple. I could see him yeah. ordering a Shirley <laughs> yeah. Temple. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, his beard looks fantastic to the point where I think Crockett's almost intimidated. I think that's why Crockett's <laughs> just doing the the five o'clock shadow look. Intimidated. He can't grow a beard like that. No, he can't but grow a beard I, like I that. I was. <laughs> I was distracted because Crockett answers the phone into this scene. Answers it as Burnett. Even though he's at lunch with his fellow vice officers in a restaurant, uh, why would someone be calling for Burnett? It's just solidifying Crockett's alcoholism. No, he it, answers the, bar, the phone at the bar. <laughs> because that's his, uh, that's like his cover, right? So he 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 answers the phone at the at the precinct that way too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, let's just how move they on. The, the ladies will take care of the check. <laughs> yeah. We'll just move on. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love that part. Yeah, the girls take care of the check. They're like, what? We just got here. What the hell are you talking about? I'm not paying for your chocolate milk. No. <laughs> <laughs> so they're racing back to the precinct because it was Stan that called and said that Esther, the wife, got a federal court order saying that it was violating his civil rights by not turning him over. So they're going to rush back to the precinct to try and stall. That way they can keep the body. I don't know why they want to keep it, but they're going to stall. Whatever's going on there, just give them the body. They got a court order now why why are you trying to get involved yeah. in that <laughs> don't they have better thing to also when crockett gets there, he tries to say that well we think you're a suspect so we're not going to turn it over and then castillo comes out and says the local judge not just a federal judge but the local judge that i've been working with says you have to turn it over here's the paperwork so i tech go get the body out of the closet <laughs> once again so i tech go haul it out please <laughs> why is white tech the only one wearing a hard hat that's not a hard hat it's just a hat isn't it it's like a safari no, hard, hard hat, hat. Yeah, it is like a safari hard hat, huh? That's yeah. what it is. That's what that was in the front. I was like, what the hell is he wearing? Because the crap keeps falling on his why head. Is he <laughs> why? <laughs> because the stuff fell on him on the de at the desk. So that's probably why he's wearing it. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they go over to the closet and surprise. Freezer tube's gone. There's just a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he's turned to liquid. <laughs> they only have like 47 and a half days to find him. <laughs> Actually, I think there's only been like two days total that yeah, exactly. all this has happened in okay. plenty of time. Okay. So when we but, but by the way, only this vice squad could lose a human popsicle. <laughs> The scene the other police the station, it would be safe and secure. No, they're keeping it in the in the freaking janitor's closet. <laughs> they don't have an evidence lockup. Where are they going to put blowing it? Blowing up an episode. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Check Geo's the dumpster. Gonna... Maybe Bob the janitor threw him away. <laughs> Maybe on accident, yeah. <laughs> 
we fade out to commercial and we fade back in, the entire Rasta family is there singing, of course. They're happy people. Including <laughs> Trudy carrying around one of the babies. Yeah, like, what the hell? <laughs> it's just so random. Like, she's just carrying out one of the babies. Like, like, it seems like they're having a good time at it. Crockett doesn't seem to be too happy about it. But at this point, is there really any question as to who took the body? No, it should be blatantly obvious to them who did. But this is where I was marked down. Like, we see that the heat is driving people crazy. We've had a couple episodes of Vice where it's been like that, where it's wearing them down. The heat is. And so in this scene, Dad comes out and says, get those people out of here. And then also Crockett's like, you have a call from the commissioner online too, by the way. Ouch. <laughs> yes. By the way, you're also about to be sued for $80 million. So now we'll never have AC. <laughs> <laughs> Dad is so done with this case that after he's done talking to the commissioner, he rips his phone out of the wall, <laughs> hands it to Sonny, and then leaves and says, you know, we're being sued. And he leaves and the commissioner calls back and Sonny's like, yeah, you might want to call him at Joe's bar. <laughs> 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 in about five minutes he'll be there don't worry <laughs> so of course we all know who's got the tube izzy's got the tube and he's stuck in traffic meanwhile the doctor's at his lab and he's talking to izzy on the car phone he's like where are you and izzy's like i'm stuck there's nothing i can do about that and that's when esther shows up and esther wants to know where our reggae popsicle is too and wants to know at gunpoint <laughs> and she eventually shoots and kills dr frobel while Izzy is on the phone, he hears the entire thing happen. So there is a witness here. If you want to believe Izzy, Izzy yes. heard the murder happen. <laughs> That's a big question, though. If you want to, he's driving around with a frozen popsicle in the in the back of his car. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the whole exchange between the doctor and the wife, he was pretty cocky that she wasn't going to do anything. And it was like, she's already suspected of killing one of you guys. Like, you should probably be nicer to her. Um, <laughs> So not surprising it ended uh, with him getting shot. So, but now the wife is on a murder spree. And there was nobody there to freeze him. They could bring him back from his gunshot. If you, yeah, <laughs> now all the doctors are put dead. Him on ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now they'll never able to thaw a reggae popsicle. <laughs> now with Izzy on the job, he could get it done. <laughs> <laughs> we have a quick stopover at the precinct where Sonny's arguing with Esther's lawyer and they're watching one of the music videos. And then when he pulls out the tape, you see the news is talking about Nevin. And then they get a call that there's shots fired at the lab and that Dr. Froebel is dead. So now for the lawyer and Sonny, both like it's chaos. Like the doctor is dead. No one knows where Nevin's body is. They're talking about it in the media. Like it's chaos now. Izzy, of course, the one of the only successful criminals in Vice. <laughs> well, I mean, except for that general guy. Um, <laughs> he seemed to get, he seemed to win pretty well. <laughs> but now all of a sudden Izzy pops up on Channel 5 being interviewed. Izzy's doing his normal, just kind of BSing everything along. So he's sitting there like, we're preheating the oven right now. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't joking. He was going to put him in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the duo had gone over to the news station and talked, you know, where Dr. Froebel was supposed to do the interview. It's like, nah, it's gonna be, he was going to call in. Then they see the interview with Izzy where he's explaining what's going to happen. And then and also t telling the people where to put the sushi that he ordered. <laughs> <laughs> because Japanese people have to eat sushi. <laughs> Once again, racist. <laughs> And then we see a really fast scene where the wife is talking to the lawyer. And the lawyer's upset. It's like, you should have let me handle this through legal channels. And she pulls out a gun and says, I'm going to take care of Izzy. And then I'm going to take care of you. So shut up. Yeah, I'm going to get my money. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to go to the unfreezing. Izzy has set everything up. It's like a waterfront, big platform that they're going to uh, have this big unveil. You would think it might take a while to defrost someone. They may not be able to like run off and jump into the Everglades. <laughs> yeah, exactly. like <laughs> pop right up. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I love how this whole thing kind of sets up. He's got the instruction booklet, and he's trying, attempting to read it. You know, and I can only imagine what the instructions are like. Like, you know, step one, uh, puncture plastic film with fork. <laughs> uh, microwave body at 50% power for 10 minutes. Uh, peel back film. <laughs> yeah. Rotate the body. <laughs> and, and then he goes to connect this unit, this, ah, the this is how you do it. It's so simple, you know, that only two people in the world could do it. It's But it's so simple. 
and he pull it. He has this little box, literally says "Thaw Unit" on it, <laughs> and has a. And it's like press the button, plug in, press the button, and thaw. Within <laughs> sixty minutes, amazing! Your, your reggae popsicle back to life. <laughs> And the Japanese investors were hoping it was going to be that easy. But okay, wait a minute. Before you do that, where's the rest of the band? I thought the band was going to be here. <laughs> I, I, this is going to be a big ordeal. We kind of want to you know, play them out. <laughs> I don't know what they wanted. <laughs> and they also have a chance to talk to Izzy. Say, we're billionaires from Japan, big businessmen. We'd love to be make this into a global venture. And now Izzy, like in cartoon style, you see his eyes spin around and then dollar signs pop in and his heart starts beating out of his chest. <laughs> <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> so Izzy races off to go pick up the band. <laughs> and when he gets there, it's like a setup <laughs> from Esther who holds him and then also takes the rest of the band at gunpoint <laughs> and they pull him on the back of the car on the trailer and they're playing their music as they go <laughs> they just look concerned yes. while they're yes. playing oh <laughs> like in that scene that the dog refuses to come like like the dog's like hell no nah, that bitch got a gun i ain't going nowhere <laughs> oh <laughs> but we get that quick scene back at the precinct when they're still like stumped at where Izzy could possibly be holding this great thawing event and stands looking at a map and he's like based on my calculations they should be somewhere in this search radius and he circles the entire map <laughs> <laughs> They get word that the lawyer has won to get the body and that the wife is also taken off to Brazil. So if they want to make anything happen, they got to do it right now. So they all race off just in a rough area of where they're supposed to be. Meanwhile, Izzy is saying to Esther, who's tying him up, like, you can torture me. I can handle anything. I was part of the revolution in La Cabana. You can't do anything to me. She's like, what if I pull you behind the car? It's like, that will work. The address <laughs> is 749. That'll do it. <laughs> I love how he tries to tell it. Murder the Toyota guy. He makes crappy cars. Like, kill him. <laughs> Sunny calls in. Trudy says they better hurry. That they got reports that a crazy woman has kidnapped some Rastafarians. That's a pretty specific 911 call. <laughs> I saw it with my own eyes in the back of a trailer playing their bongos. <laughs> Sonny is now taking this personal. He doesn't want to kill. He doesn't want Esther to kill Izzy. He wants to kill Izzy. So, But they can't find the site, so they're going to go off. They're going to take a chance. they got one more stop to see if this one will work. So now we go to the last scene. It's at the unfreezing. The band, Izzy and Esther, show up. They're on the trailer. They're playing music. Esther gets out, holds them all at gunpoint, has them go down where the ceremony is taking place at the end of the dock. They go down. She holds everyone at gunpoint, including the Japanese investors, and once the tube loaded up in the trailer. Then, somehow, the duo come racing by in a boat out in the water, which distracts Esther. Izzy then goes for the gun. There's a struggle. It turns oh, into a hey. Donnybrook, where everyone <laughs> starts fighting each other. <laughs> Dude, this is the worst bust in the history of Vice. Essentially, they went, found a speedboat and they were just gonna what splash them like that's how the bus <laughs> breaks out like they're just gonna drive by and just kick a bunch a wave up to them get them all wet and then just like cruise back to the dock like this is the worst bus ever secondly the way it doesn't work they don't get all wet but they break out into a fight why is everybody fighting there is only one person with a gun everybody else should be pretty neutral at this point <laughs> exactly <laughs> What is Why do the Toyota fight? guys and the reggae guys not get along? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's happening. But all I know is that the gun gets kicked into the water on extra on purpose. I don't know. And then also Nevin gets torpedoed out of the casing and <laughs> shot right out. The freezer tube, him in the freezer tube, gets shot out into the water and sinks to the <laughs> bottom of the water. Esther realizes at the last moment that that's what's happened as the duo finally, after laughing at the fight happening, finally get out of the boat, fire some shots into the air, and everyone gets under control. But I don't know why everyone's fighting. I don't know why they, when it broke out into a brawl, that everyone had to turn against each other, not Hang up on Esther and just rip her apart. <laughs> <laughs> She's the one holding you guys at gunpoint. Like, don't take it out on the Toyota guys. Which, by the way, Crockett makes that that statement. You know, hey, go back to Tokyo. Like, hey, man, racist much? Like, yeah, I know. come on, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> and then we end this episode 
in the most amazing fashion. It pans across the ocean and you see wandering the seven seas <laughs> of the world is Nevin's freezer tube. And you just hear the music. This yes. land is your <laughs> land. This land is my land. As he just floats out across. The as we saw him sink. <laughs> He's floating now. And But the the yes. freezer tube is still good so, for another 84 days. <laughs> well, they so never forever, water in it. being aimlessly across the Atlantic Ocean, there is a frozen Rastafarian. Um, <laughs> like, he's going to become a legend, you know? Like, <laughs> like he's going to wash up places and save burning bu- people from burning buildings. and <laughs> People are going to write notes on him and then push him back out into the ocean. <laughs> uh <laughs> And then that's the end of the episode. Thank God. Believe it or not, that's how this episode ends. It's a freezer tube just floating out in the ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean. (laughs) I don't know how to feel. I don't know how we got here. I don't know what I just watched. I don't know. How do we? (laughs) How? Why? How? (laughs) I'm still trying to figure out. I'm still trying to figure out what what law was broken i mean except for the murders being investigated by homicide we made that clear homicide was investigating the murders so outside of the the homicides what exactly were we investigating i don't know and i don't know why vice Uh, needed to be involved like i don't know like is no one worried like so okay so the guy's wife is getting arrested for murder both the doctors are dead obviously izzy's not gonna deal with the jet with the japanese at this point so no one cares about the floating rastafarian (laughs) they don't even try and get him or anything like fish him out can't they get a big neck who gets his 30 million (laughs) dollar estate yeah who knows izzy (laughs) it's a treasure hunt now whoever can find him (laughs) (laughs) well Let's go talk about this week's music and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense than what this episode did. Let's go break down the music. All right, John, we got a couple of people I don't know anything about and really couldn't find any information about. And then also Bob Marley. So (laughs) 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 what do you got for us? I had a little bit. I had a little bit more luck. It's definitely a reggae theme. We did get a little bit of some salsa type music, but mostly reggae. So obviously we have Bob Marley and we're going to spend some time talking about him. But let's talk about the other two first. Get those out of the way. We have What is Life by Black Uhuru, which is a Jamaican reggae group formed in 1972. The group went through a number of lineup changes over the years with Derek Ducky Simpson being the mainstay. So they saw their success mostly during the 80s with the album Anthem. In 1985, they actually won a be- uh, gra- uh, Grammy for best reggae album they and they've had some used in like video games like they had their song great train robbery used in grand theft auto san andreas they had a song used in scarface the video game they were formed in kingston in 72 initially called the black sounds of uru uru being a swahili word for freedom throw out a name of a nice favorite they worked extensively with sly and robbie who we had in our music before they recorded oh. a string of successful singles, and that was kind of the start to their climb to success. By the end of the 80s, things kind of started to fizzle out. They stopped working with Simon Robbie. Sandra Jones, who had joined the band during their popularity, left the band because of cancer diagnosis. She would eventually die of cancer in 1990. Her replacement would leave almost immediately. After being denied a U.S. visa, she was unable to tour. And uh, it it eventually whittled all the way down to just Simpson himself. So he was coincidentally, at that point, booked to play an awards show in California that also was featuring several of the original members of Black Uru. It would reunite from 91 to 96 until the band would break up after Simpson would sue Don and Garth because they started touring in the U.S. under the name without that without Simpson, 
So Simpson eventually won the lawsuit in 97 and pretty much continues to to tour under that name. And just like every couple of years, he just remakes the band. There's still just all kinds of turnover with who, who's in the band. It's pretty much Simpson's deal. Our next song is My Vieja by Fernando Echevarria y la Familia Andres. I... John, I always appreciate your pronunciation of Spanish, especially when you put the little flair on it. I love it. (laughs) I'll try. (laughs) I I really try. This is going to be kind of interesting. This is kind of our intermission in our music, because a lot of times I come across these where these guys weren't a band very long. There's not a lot of information on the web about them. This is based off of their album, Amor, Amor. In 1987, it was pretty much one of the main and kind of like big things. They One of the only successful albums they did, from what I can tell. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know that much about this. But what I do know is that depending on what biography you look at, Fernando Echevarria, there's, there's some discrepancies. He's a <laughs> singer-songwriter from Santa Domingo, Dominican Republic, and was possibly born August 14th, 1953. Possibly. <laughs> well, at the same time, at, well, hold on, at, on September 5th, 1953, less than a month later, a Chilean businessman, so named Fernando Echevarri, was also born. I do not know if they were one and the same, both be 64 <laughs> today. <laughs> but I also read a biography that said that he was born not in 53, but in December 7th, 1952. And apparently he died in 2015. Mm, unfortunately. So depending unfortunately, on who you we can't believe, ask him. Yes. Depending <laughs> on who you believe, he is either alive, a Chilean businessman, or he is dead. <laughs> Maybe he's frozen floating <laughs> through the ocean. <laughs> I will say the one that claims he is dead, I I, I kind of put the most behind because I actually had some more information. He claimed that he, uh, prior to taking up music, he graduated as an architect and worked in creative advertising. He was widely considered the father of fusion. He won national awards with La Familia Andres and international awards. And he had moved to Miami in 2012, eventually settled back in San Domingo. And while preparing to go on stage in San Domingo on October 11th, 2015, he suffered a massive heart attack. Mm. Now, I would believe that, but the news source attached to it that they provided was a Fox News <laughs> news <laughs> clip. So, I mean, just kind of take it... <laughs> As you will. <laughs> so let's talk about who actually came here to talk about. Let's talk about Bob Marley. Songs Wings of a Dove and Wake Up and Live are featured in this episode. Bob Marley, the iconic Jamaican singer-songwriter, was born February 6th, 1945, and unfortunately passed away May 11th, 1981. And I mean, just international and cultural icon, famous for songs like No Woman, No Cry, One Love, Buffalo Soldiers, I Shot the Sheriff, Go Tell It on the Mountaintop. I mean, just so much. So we're going to just run through a little bit of of the history of him. I'm going to, I'm going to try and Summarize it quickly, so if I leave some stuff out, it's it's not intentional. It's just so I don't bore you to death, because I could go on for about two pages worth. His full name is Robert Nesta Marley. Marley and Newville Livingston, later known as Bunny Whaler, were actually childhood friends growing up in Nine Mile in Jamaica. They actually began playing together as far back as junior high, and would eventually get a place together in Trenchtown, where they would join a vocal group with... So a local musician, Joe Higgs, who was already part of a somewhat successful group called Higgs and Wilson, Higgs would help develop Marley's vocals and actually teach him how to play guitar. In 1963, Marley, Bunny Whaler, Peter Tosh, Junior Braithwaite, Beverly Kelso, and Cherry Smith formed the Teenagers. The Teenagers would become the Wailing Rude Boys. The Wailing Rude Boys would become the Wailing Whalers. <laughs> who would be discovered by record producer uh, Coxon Dodd. They would become just the Whalers because all of those other names were silly. <laughs> I 
I wish I wish they could just continue to go on forever, <laughs> coming up a variation of something wailing. <laughs> yes, yes. So they would record a sing. They would record the single "Simmer Down," which would become number one in Jamaica on February 1974. They would go on from there to start performing regularly with other reg and recording with other reggae artists. And by 1966, Braithwaite, also and Smith would leave the band, leaving just Marley, Whaler, and Tosh. Also in 66, Marley would marry Rita Anderson. He would move to the United States briefly to live near his mom in, of all places, Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, yes, Delaware. Think, think Bob Marley and think, like, where would you least expect him to live? <laughs> Delaware. I'm actually constantly surprised that people he, live in Delaware. <laughs> I've gone years without thinking about yes. Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. It's a state. Sorry, people from Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> so while living in Delaware for a short time, he worked at a DuPont lab as a lab assistant. And he also worked on the line at a Chrysler plant. Under the alias Donald Marley. <laughs> Why, I have no idea. <laughs> so, he would then move back to Jamaica and get really interested in, Rast uh, in Rastafarian beliefs. He would convert and start growing his famous dreadlocks. And then after a financial disagreement with Bond, he would move on to working first with Lee Scratch Perry and the Upsetters. Another fantastic name. <laughs> <laughs> and then Leslie Kong, who Leslie Kong is one of the four major develop uh, developers of the reggae sound. At least that's like musically. He's one of the four like big producers that brought reggae to the forefront in the 70s. So from 60, 68 to 72, they recut some old demos, but uh, nothing really worth releasing. And then 72 to 74, they moved to Island Records pretty much, and replaced another Vice musical guest, Jimmy Cliff. Mm. They would release Catch Fire in 73, their first album that would be released worldwide. And they would actually package it uniquely, almost like a... a like a rock record where they package it like a Zippo lighter with a lift top. Pretty cool. Uh, initially, it only sold sold 14,000 records, though it got positive reception. And the following year allowed them to release Burning, which featured the song I Shot the Sheriff. So funny story. Eric Clapton's guitarist, George Terry, gifted him the album and he liked it. Liked it so much when he heard the song I Shot the Sheriff that he covered it. And this is two years later. Uh, I believe two years after the release, and it would be Clapton's first U.S. hit since Layla. Marley and the Whalers would be seeing so much success with Island that Island founder and their producer, Chris Blackwell, would gift Marley his Kingston estate, which also came with a studio, which he would name Tough Gong Studio, because the names are just fantastic in this biography. <laughs> They would go on to be scheduled to open 17 shows for Sly and the Family Stone, but would be fired after only opening the first couple because they were, and I love this line, and this is what I love about Wikipedia, is that you can sense the bias in people's <laughs> biographies. They were fired because they were popular than the acts they were opening for. <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. They dis yeah, I don't think that's how it works either. So, But they disbanded in 74. Marley continued to perform as Bob Marley and the Wailers, but with a different lineup, not including Bunny Whaler. So, odd. <laughs> 1975, they would release Natty Dread, which would feature No Woman, No Cry, followed by... Rasta Vibration in 76, which would lead them with a top 50 billboard on their soul charts. In 76, they though, in two days before a free concert to try and ease tensions between warring political parties, Marley, his wife, and his manager were attacked in his home by a gunman and wounded. And actually, his wife and his manager were wounded pretty severely. Everyone would end up recovering. And Marley would still perform the concert, even though several of the Whalers would, would actually be in hiding from threats. Damn. So after being attacked, Marley from Se uh, would leave Jamaica. He would set. He would take a stint in the Bahamas, 
recovering and writing, and then would spend the next two years in what he, what would be self-imposed exile, living in London. He would record two more albums, these ones containing his hits Jammin', One Love. Ultimately, under the name Bob Marley and the Whalers, he would release 11 albums. 1980s Rising would be his final studio album, and after Actually, his most religious album featuring a redemption song and actually wouldn't be released until 83, actually after he had already passed away. It also included the unreleased Buffalo Soldier, which is actually one of his most popular songs posthumously. We're getting around toward the end. In 1977, Marley was found to have a type of malignant meloma under one of his toenails on, on his toe. And rather than having his toe amputated, he elected to just have the nail removed and the nail bed removed that, so that when affect his mobility, it, he could continue touring and he enjoyed playing soccer and jogging. He was actually pre in pretty good shape for a pothead. <laughs> so he would continue touring, um, though he would still be, uh, he would still be kind of sick, kind of battling illness while he toured. In fact, he would undertake a world tour in 1980 which would feature a concert in Milan with over a thousand people in the audience, which would be his biggest show to date. He would go from that tour to a U.S. tour where he would do two shows in New York at Madison Square Garden. During this time, he collapsed during a jogging tour of Central Park. And after taken to a hospital, he would learn that the cancer actually never went away and it had now spread to his brain. So, and it actually got quick after that. So two yeah. days later, he was playing his la what would be his last show in Pittsburgh on September 23rd, 1980. Shortly after that show, he would learn that the cancer had spread throughout his entire body, can canceled the rest of the tour, and as his health began to quickly decline, he would seek treatment at a Bavarian clinic uh, that, fi that specialized in alternative medicine. After eight months without any real success of the treatments, he decided he was going to return home for the last his last days. But on his trip home from Germany to Jamaica, they would he would have to be hospitalized in Miami, where he would have actually eventually pass away May eleventh, nineteen eighty one. Tragic ending to a just massively iconic career, and once again, just some of the most fantastic names in, in the history of biographies. <laughs> So, hey, you know, John, I said that I was hoping that this music would make more sense. And you had someone in there, but you're like, I don't know. He might be a businessman. <laughs> we don't know. Person. We don't know. So there's still yeah. mystery in the music. By the way, if you're a Chilean <laughs> businessman and you were in the and you performed with La Family Andreas, please contact the show and let us know that you are still alive. <laughs> we may have told people the wrong information. Yes. Yes. Don't blame us, though. This is all Fox's new Fox News' fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go get our final thoughts on this episode. I don't know how to feel. So let's go talk <laughs> this one out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll kick off this week. I'm going to give Vice the benefit of the doubt. This episode was a lot of fun, and it was fun on purpose. They made a lot of jokes. There was a lot of inside jokes. There was a lot of vice style jokes. And there was also just straight out like uh, we're trying outwardly trying to be funny. And we know that in season three, one of the complaints that people had was that it was too serious. It was too dark. It was too serious. And so in season four, they wanted to make it more fun. It has me nervous is that they're taking it too far. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this was just the one episode. They have a lot of fun. They make a, a lot of jokes and we move on. Then we go back to classic vice. Then we get this out of our system. And it's nice in season yeah. one and two that they have jokes worked into the script and stuff. It's nice when little things come up here and there. We feel, I feel like we got a little too far, but it's okay. Just one. It's just one. It's just one, guys. Don't freak out. I'm not freaking out. Don't freak out that this is what's <laughs> happening to my life. Don't freak out. This is just one episode. We're just having fun. They had a lot of fun. The writers had a lot of fun with this one. We'll move on. Everything's fine. Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Uh, my thoughts a lie. No, I'm <laughs> I know what happens. Everything's not fine. Panic. Everyone panic. No. It's silly. It's a silly episode. I don't and I don't like the silly episodes. I was one of the people that liked the serious episodes. It was fine. Um, it's got Izzy. It's a highlight, right? 
It's got tubs with his beer, drinking hot, not hot chocolate. Let's just say hot chocolate, chocolate milk, or potentially a shake. I don't know. Something. <laughs> There's that. I think that's why Tech and Trudy fighting was funny. I don't know. I'm, that's what I'm going to highlight. I think we're just saying like the episode was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun watching it, but. but it has to go back to being <laughs> not so silly at some point. I hope, right? Sean, what are your final thoughts? So I, I'm with you guys. You know, like like you like you said, Dom. One of the complaints was it wasn't serious enough. We got back to that goofy season one B team style joking. Uh, I think I agree with what you guys said. Not looking from a different perspective, this episode strangely had so many random things flowing through it from like a seven degrees of kevin bacon perspective we have we have a connection to donald trump a connection to a chilean businessman we have a connection <laughs> fox news you know we're, 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 we're... the wire we, we, we... bob marley yes yeah. <laughs> Really, I mean, there is just so much going on in all aspects of this episode. I, I, I think the only thing we are actually missing in this episode is actual police work. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no crime committed, so what are they going to do? <laughs> Well, that is going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. And you know what? For the first time, Go With The Heat and my advice, they match. We're all just trying to have a whole bunch of fun, poke some jokes at some things that were happening in the late 80s. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Tweet at us at go with the heat. Get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash go with the heat. Let us know what you think of this episode and what you think of Fun Vice when they just, you know what, throw caution to the wind. Let's just have a silly story and do silly stuff. Let's call people waffle heads and have a freezer tube floating with a Rastafarian Rosta, mm -hmm. popsicle across the Atlantic Ocean. Let's just go for it. Yes. What do you think of these episodes? Let us know. Email us at theheat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, including tune in, YouTube. If you like to watch the show or say have it playing on your TV while you do stuff around the house, we got you. Go to YouTube.com. You can search for Go With The Heat. Go to GoWithTheHeat.com. You can find a link straight to the channel. and be able to play it on your Apple TV if you want to, I guess. <laughs> Pe people do that. <laughs> <laughs> also, go to support. We would love to have your support. Step one of support. Review the show. Go to your podcatcher platform of choice. Review the show. Give it five sunflowers, four pickles. Whatever <laughs> the rating system is, give us the highest rating. <laughs> Don't leave a review. No one reads the reviews. Just talk about how much you love Bob Marley in the review. Just go ahead and do that inside of there. Everything will be just fine. Also, be sure to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We have a ton of things we would love to do with the show. Check that out and find out all the ways that we want to grow the show and all the new cool things that we want to do. Patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pal.